Hello everyone and welcome back to the EGFC. We are back here continuing week 15 action, continuing our battles between the Central Conference. Another one here, a couple of Western Coast schools, Weber State going up against the University of Colorado with playoff, playoff implications on the line. Eight and six for Colorado going up against three and three Weber State. Should be a fun one. Yeah, we're getting right into it as Zerosian and Diora are kicking things off. Uh, Zerosian not usually a lead-in for Colorado State. Show, just goes to show how important setting the tone is in a game that has so many playoff implications. But Diora is one that usually ends up kicking off for Weber State with their Aegis. Yeah, interesting. As you noted, Zerosian usually typically one of the anchors of Colorado. He's had a little bit of a rougher season, but he is also one of the players that Colorado cited as one of the most dangerous on their roster, and they trusted him with a lot of difficult matchups in the past. Diora, on the flip side of that, as you also mentioned, typically one of the starters, and this Pyramithra has had its ups and downs one and two so far, but in a crucial set, we'll have to see how they do. So far, Diora is the one who is behind here at 82%, but they can get in and do some damage very quickly. That up be dangerously close to landing, but Zerosian, good invasion. So far, doing a decent job of continuing to whittle away at this stock. 120 on Diora. Nearly finds the grab, won't find it. It's going to be Diora. The switch, the force match doesn't land. The dash attack nearly takes that stock. This is the most. Uh, this is a very different Pyra and Mithra, as that ledge drop did not seem to be intended, and his erosion punishes accordingly. But the goal of this, uh, of this Mithra especially, has been first and foremost run across the ground full sprint no, don't stop if you don't have to this come at a cost of a lot of the usual starters and usual setups for eat uh, for mithra but the pirate has done a very good job of picking up the slack when it comes to damage there's the down throw that we've been waiting for though only 16 percent yet the photon edge uh, is able to wrap it up diora starting to get a little bit of momentum here and frequently switching back and forth I like that they're always trying to give Zerosian a different look. And these forward smashes have never been shot. <laughs> <laughs> the forward smashes coming out, but not really finding their mark here for Diora. But Zerosian is in the lead. 58% of their name. They'll be able to air dodge around. And so far, fairly clean. Dash attack is Diora off stage, but not be able to clean it up quite yet. The early up B won't do it either, but that charge shot will, and all of a sudden Zerosian has built themselves up a pretty substantial lead. That was a really good pull, uh, trigger pulled on some of these charge shots. That's the down throw, and the back air comes in as well. Looking for the down air on the photon edge, but not finding it. This could be the stock, but nothing doing it as of yet. Looks like Zerosian was just trying to punish Ledge, but couldn't hit. And a great fastball from Zerosian as well. Had to hold your breath a little bit there as Diora swings for the fences time and time again. Good grab, no clean follow. We've seen Diora a couple times get that forward throw and try and follow it up immediately. It seems like a decent idea, but so far no avail. Zerosian sells his jump so he'll be able to make it back, but he does <laughs> end up getting caught by the forward smash there. That's the, the coverage on that move incredibly strong, but Diara might be working on borrowed time here. 109 of their name. They're caught along this ledge. Where do you go from here? Neutral get up. They shield the charge shot and they've made it back to stage. But can they get anything done? Nair knocks them back off once again at 125. Relatively light. The down tilt was pulled too early. The bomb connected, but the follow up from Zerosian wasn't there. They'll be able to get around. There's the grab, the up throw. Not going to be able to take the stock quite yet. The switch to Pyra here. A little bit heavier, but it's not going to matter. All the hits above up air connect and Zerosian. Zerosian takes game one. Tight game, but Zerosian, in the classic Samus way, pulled ahead steadily, steadily further and further with every interaction. And this very interesting game of chicken that never seemed to go Diora's way, who would oftentimes land right in front of the charge shot charging Zerosian. And in that second stock, 
guessed wrong, but in stock three, frequently would guess right the fact that Erosion was looking something, looking for something a little bit more complicated than just land and do nothing. So it was a, it was a neat dynamic going on, but Zerosian never needed to overcommit and force out those charge shots and spend time charging because they always managed to hold the lead. Yeah, and uh, it was only a one stock victory, but I feel like the difference maker was that Zerosian, it felt like a lot of kind of right idea, wrong execution, right? Like you said, there were times when that charge shot could have probably been used, especially along the ledge, but instead he was looking for something else. He might have been looking for something, like you said, a little bit more uh, complicated when, you know, maybe you just take what you can get, but it allowed Diora chances to come back into the game. And even I'm thinking back to that second stock, I believe it was, that uh, Zerosian comes back to stage with that forward air. That's a decent idea. You know, drop ledge, just come back with that forward air, multi hit, covers a lot of space. But that forward smash just beat it outright. And so it's those little moments that allowed Diora to kind of stop the bleeding there in game number one. Yeah, what I really want to see from Zerosian is a little bit more uh, focus on when they can uh, when they can get these really big punishes or when they can uh, overwhelm some of their some of uh, Diora's uh, more lax nature with uh, with some of their aggression. And on the part of Diora, you're finding these grabs, you're finding these openings, and you're deciding to go forward throw dash attack, which, sure, works, but it hasn't been working at the really low percents you've been finding them at. So sometimes it's okay to keep it simple. Down throw forward air into, into chase with Mithra is pretty good. But instead, looking for forward throw, immediately switching to Pyra and gets a forward smash with all that. You know what? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's something to be said about if it ain't broke, don't fix it, but uh, these forward smashes, it feels like a coin flip. They either connect or they don't, and right now, I guess as of late, has been able to connect them. But that being said, they are at a major disadvantage. That, that forward smash, the only hit they landed, and Diara is up to 116, and the bombs over this ledge are doing a lot of work. And that forward air, not going to be able to take the stock quite yet. Side B gets them back to stage. Zerosian wasn't quite ready for it, but another forward air lands. Diora forced to recover low. The switch to Pyra. The bomb intercepts, but only for a moment. No up B instead. Ops for the forward tilt. And Zerosian continuing to whittle away at this stock. Good air dodge around. Keeps Diora alive, but only for a moment. They approach and they get up beat instead. And that is stock number one off the board. Yeah, now they're almost staying too much in the air. They're jumping straight at Zerosian, trying to blow them up with something, uh, with either a big starter or at least just go air to air. And sometimes you just don't need to do that. And Mithra has an amazing dash attack that, while it may not combo out a forward throw at zero, it still covers a ton of space and really is a, part, a menace to flow to your characters as that down air won't combo into up smash with these high percents. But Diora is still keeping it close with the neutral winner that is Pyra's side special, that blazing end. Just needs the stock off of moments like this. Another blazing end keeps Zerosian off stage and in a t in disadvantage. But Zerosian keeps themselves alive at 143. Good hit there, but Diora still looking to try and find a way to take the stock. Now the switch to Mithra, trying to keep up with the speed, but the forward air of Zerosian lands and now Mithra has to make it back to stage. Neutral get up, they'll end up shielding that charge shot, but they get their jump caught. A B, gonna buy him a little bit of a second here along the ledge, but only a second. That side B just getting past his erosion. Still, he's at 183, and you can tell Dyer wants to take the stock, but the Pyra has not had a, a real clean opportunity to do so since that switch back to Mithra. The side B's racking up the percentage. Now, uh, it's Pyra back. And he finds the forward tilt off of the roll there. So stock number one off the board is erosion, but that took a lot of work just to take that first stock. Yeah, a lot of work indeed, but these photon edges have been solid at getting uh, getting Diora back to stage. Zerosian not finding a proper punish on any of these. That forward smash just whiffing, and Diora keeps themselves in a position to put a 
put some of the Pyra shenanigans back onto their uh, into the fourth front. That Parominance Revolt not doing it, but Zerosian still has not found the killing blow. Ooh, as, as Dior swings for the fences and keeps going, tick for tat, and Zerosian has been stuck at ledge for so long. 148 on Diora. They get caught here in the up throw. Yes, that will be enough to do it, even with the weight of Pyra. So there is the last stock scenario here is <laughs> swinging for the fences, trying to find a way to even this one up as Diora. I back think to back Dior forward. Wants smashes. to take the stock. I think <laughs> that's what's on their mind. Uh, you know, uh, son, the wind told me it, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but. Still, they are looking, still looking, uh, opting to get a little bit more percent on with this Mithra, but now the switch back, 90% on Zerosian, and Order not going to land there from Zerosian, that up B also won't find its mark, couple of heavy hits not quite landing, I like the setup there from Zerosian, but it doesn't quite get the full extent there and Diora able to take advantage run off back air I believe that was knocks Zerosian away but he kept his jump and so he'll make it back Zerosian done such a good job of surviving up to these high percents gets jabbed but he's able to get away and that up he won't be able to edge guard and Zerosian again surviving and the turnaround of the forward smash will do it two stocks in game number two five points headed Colorado's way yeah the side the, it's <laughs> How do I put it? The Achilles heel for Zer, uh, for Diora was their own eagerness. Hey, I have them at the ledge. I've been able to ledge that pretty good. And now I'm going to cover a lot of options with this photon edge because I think they're going to roll. And then this is a huge commitment on a read that they could have covered in a lot of different, much safer ways. And they die for it very, very early. These drop from Halo forward smashes instead of trying to set up a, uh, a set up stage control and use that invulnerability to find a grab or something like the the utilization of FD just wasn't fully there just like the utilization of PS2 wasn't fully there an understanding but as you like to say it good ideas but a lack of execution yeah and uh it's yeah, absolutely. I feel like that was the case uh, in this first set because, well, you said you said it best when you're trying to cover the ledge. There are safer ways to go about it. Yes, you have these kind of you have these moves in your kit that can cover a lot of options like the side B from Mithra, like the uh, forward smash from Pyra. But you have to use them a little bit more sparingly so that they can be as threatening as, you know, they so that they can live up to their potential as that massive threat that Zerosian has to worry about. I think credit is, well, credit where credit's due though to Zerosian, who towards the end of that game, I pointed out, was living to very high percents, you know, their, their ability to survive. And it is a lot easier when, you know, it is a lot more bait and punish of these heavier punishes, but still, we look at Pyra as one of these characters that should be able to secure stocks very easily, and Pyra got mitigated a lot. The Pyra could not get much done. It was oftentimes the side B to cover, you know, uh, to force them to recover low. The down air could never quite connect. The forward smash took a stock in game number one, but never really found its mark in game number two. Pyra being almost completely mitigated was a huge difference maker in this set. Yeah, I mean, if you're living for till 170 when you do have pyra to set up strong ledge traps i mean we saw something like that happen in game two with up tilts attempted to come out use pyra's massive range and huge kill power to cover a lot of space but it was always a little bit too late pulled the trigger a little bit too early uh, but some sometimes you can do the easy stuff like you don't need to try and find a use for photon edge we know the move is fine but not especially amazing so lean on the pyra in those ledge trapping situations stand very far back and cover so much space with this massive disjointed forward tilt cover jumps with up air and up tilt like there's there's a flow chart to this there and there's a reason there's a flow chart to this even if it's not always applicable it gives you a general sense of what the characters want to do and sometimes you don't need to get fancy with it yeah, uh, certainly the case. Getting ready for set number two now. Players have been locked in. We're getting word that it's going to be mediocre versus Doc Hunt. Now, uh, 
<laughs> Mediocre, I don't believe we've seen him this season for the side of Colorado. He is the Crom that you'll be seeing on screen versus Doc Hunt, who has been, I think, the Duck Hunt of the EGF until recently. We saw Pyro's Duck Hunt very strong in that performance against the Paul. We'll see if Doc Hunt can live up to it. If there is anyone who can, I mean, it has to be Doc Hunt. Numerous three stocks the last time we saw him for the side of Weaver State. Mediocre here will certainly have his, uh, uh, his task cut out for him. He's up to 90 on this first stock here. Yeah, what I always find interesting about Weber State, who I believe we've had almost every one of their matches on this second stream, is the the way that they start off rather slow. They usually try and like take their time a little bit, and their uh, their openers aren't always amazing. But then they'll send in a killer like Doc Hunt, like Yep, like Yo or Beta, and just find a find a start to okay but then there you get robbed by crom and suddenly all that momentum can go right out the door as you're in a desperate desperate position to try and gain momentum the unfortunate things of duck hunt though that stock does quickly fall back to even huge oh. stock yeah, a huge stock for mediocre to take there. I mean, I don't know what percent what Doc Hunt was at. I don't, I didn't catch that. But I mean, the fact that mediocre takes that stock at such a high percent and evens it back up just like that is, oh my goodness, Doc Hunt, where are you going? Landing on the main stage. That is not safe whatsoever. And the forward smash cleans up stock number two. You know, that was just like, I bet you're going to air dodge. And then they didn't, but Doc Hunt gave it to them anyway. It's like, you know what, bud? You tried real hard. I'll give you the read. Like, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it's mediocre answering the call here. I mean, you mentioned it. Doc Hunt has numerous three stocks on their record of many very solid players. And mediocre, even if you're just able to keep it close and sustain this lead, perhaps even get a game with how the percents are looking and Krom's own ability to keep these electric traps long and arduous for their opponents. You're feeling amazing about this if you're Colorado. But Doc Hunt is slowly trying to regain that center positioning that they hold so strongly. Running out of options here. That's a good air dodge by Doc Hunt. Didn't have the can or the discus really to try and threaten outside of that gun that had to air dodge early, but they are working away at this percent, and I feel like Doc Hunt just has to do so much work right now to keep things close here. Has to play so perfect because of the speed of this character, but just like that, things are back to even. We fell out of two up airs. That's so tragic, but it comes with comes through the price of the character and you have to acknowledge how to play around that oh i love the patience from mediocre will this be an edge guard a successful edge guard that can explodes and mediocre sent the other way sent to the left holding stage position it does end up being the difference maker for doc hunt as they do close out that very tight game with a one stock victory putting themselves on the board for the first time this set what a huge victory that was, too. I mean, after the second stock gets obliterated by that forward smash, uh, Doc Hunt spent the rest of that game coming back. And it just, on that last stock of his, he was on the left side of the ledge for so long, it felt like, uh, just trying to get back to stage. And he had to burn so much. He had to use the, the gunman to try and position him to cover just the the main platform he used the can to try and cover the upper platform and then he still had to air dodge or you know dip low to up b to make sure crom didn't just run off forward air it felt like dog hunt had so much setup and, and so much work to do but that's the danger of this character you give him the time to do that dog hunt has proven that he can execute so mediocre here will have to find a way to respond headed into game number two and I generally liked their game plan overall. I mean, one errant forward smash that just ended up working anyway uh, aside, they played to some of Krom's more cheesier win conditions with that soaring slash uh, stock. Oh, but they will pull out the cloud instead. Uh, Krom's very linear recovery just is can fodder in many ways. Cloud 
does a little bit better, especially since Cloud has access to a wall jump on this triplast stage as we go to Yoshi's Story. Second appearance of Yoshi's Story today, but we'll have to see if Mediocre can make great use of it. They've got the percent lead. They use that limit cross slash early here at Doc Hunt to get 84%, and now forward tilt knocks Doc Hunt off stage. They are able to grab it. Ooh, but that connects. That's not going to take the stock quite yet. Run off forward air won't land either. There's that wall jump you were talking about. They'll be able to make it back safe and sound. And Mediocre, in firm control of stock number one here. Only 12% to their name. Yeah, they removed that center space that Doc Hunt had been using to both approach as well as to uh, find ways to uh, that center airspace that would be controlled by Can. That's gone, marked off by that top platform. So Mediocre can always keep a roof over their head if need be, but you're getting juggled by Duck Hunt as that could have been very dangerous if not for a timely air dodge. Yet Duck Hunt keeps the coverage on lock as now 98%. This game is effectively even as both are starting to reach these prominent kill percents. Doc Hunt looking exclusively for up air. Meanwhile, Mediocre is having a hard time closing out the stock, and a pair of clay pigeons will close out that stock after a combo into the up air. Amazing chain from one side of the stage to the other, as Doc Hunt still thriving at 153 and still thriving at zero. <laughs> but given their spot that they had found themselves in very early in this game, you're not feeling too bad about that. The timing is everything, and a game that seemed firmly in Mediocre's control in that first stock has slowly dissipated back to even. They burned the early cross slash again and got the can out of the way, but now you have to deal with Doc Hunt, the character. Those up airs really starting to find their mark. The back air knocks them off stage and now trying to find their way back here. They'll be able to avoid the up B. Doc Hunt not afraid still to play around the, the sides of the stage, have that time to set up the cans and, and the uh, discus throws, but it also buys mediocre time to charge up that limit, which can be ever so threatening here. Doc Hunt doing a good job of covering a lot of options, but mediocre, this stock in particular, finding a lot of ways in and now playing a little, excuse me, a little bit more careful. They're finding a lot more backers, but that's a good spike. One of the double couldn't find it, and I think he might have gotten a footstool there. Mediocre, no jump, and won't survive, and the dash attack can't answer back quite yet. Oh, I like that. Traveling up with the can, after, especially after such a huge stock, and that's really been the difference maker for Doc Hunt. These conversions mid in mid stage have been few and far between, but what they have been able to find is stocks that matter and openings that have resulted in stocks instead of just leaving it all to the slow burn that Doc Hunt can sometimes subscribe to. But that forward tilt before the bleeding gets too out of hand, mediocre not living up to their name at all and giving us a very good show in these two games with a pair of sorties. 12% on Doc Hunt right now. Limit will get burned early here to try and even up that percent, but now Mediocre off stage and the runoff back here. That's just going to be enough to do it. Doc Hunt in quick and clean fashion on third stock seals away this set. Yeah, answering with a stock of their own, but keeping it minimal is the way to uh, go about it when it comes to any sort of losses in a format like this. Only a four point lead does keep University of Colorado in the lead by a single point. Will that point end up mattering? Maybe, maybe not. But if you're able to keep one, two stock in your belt, then it just keeps adding to that pressure on Weber State to perform in every single set yeah no absolutely and remember th this is a very big game for both of these two teams colorado they're kind of right on the cusp of that playoff border right on the inside of that playoff bubble teams are either trying to catch them or colorado is trying to you know catch the teams ahead of them to secure themselves a spot they are that border team at the moment and weber state right there with them just a game behind them because of that win uh percentage being that first initial tiebreaker being at a dead even percent they are that that bubble team that's right there with them so an impactful game for both of these schools and 
players rising to the occasion. Interestingly to note, if this is Mediocre's real first appearance here at EGF to put him in second, is kind of a, a, a gut check here. And Colorado, I mean, Mediocre, despite losing that set, kept it very close with one of the the designated hitters, I guess, of this uh, Weber State roster. Yeah, and normally you see Daka oftentimes batting cleanup and coming in at that third or that, uh, that fourth rung and being so strong in that moment. But this time coming in second and it's a tight one leading into the remainder. Still killers on the Weber State lineup who is confirmed uh, that we can see uh, with Ray coming up next as well as Beta and Yo-Yo Guy in the back. But... University of Colorado, we can ensure that we're going to see a player like Endure ready to go late in the lineup. But their other two slots uh, will be, one of them will belong to N, as we're going to have N and Ray step up for this pivotal round three. An interesting one to say the least. N, one of the highlight players of this Colorado roster. We haven't seen him every week, but we have seen him for the vast majority of the season in situations like this. He is 10 and 0 on the season, and most notably, he took down MIA in that matchup, in one of their matchups, I guess, against Mississippi State. On the flip side, as you mentioned, Ray being locked in for the side of Weber State. Ray, we've seen two very different uh, styles of characters in his two appearances. Week one, we saw him play the Daisy, and the Daisy got shut down by a Pokemon trainer, if I'm remembering correctly. The next week, his Captain Falcon looked very, very clean uh, in their win, which I believe was about two weeks ago. So we'll have to see if Ray is ready to rise to the occasion this week, if he's got a third character on deck, or if he feels like riding the Captain Falcon once more. But against N, who has exclusively gone Robin, I'm curious to see what the game plan is going in. Robin's an awkward one, particularly well against either of these characters. Robin has surprisingly good edge guarding as well as ledge, a very notably good ledge trapping, which can make a character like Falcon find themselves stuck for a very long time. And some of Robin's best neutral tools, things like Arc Fire and the Thunder series, as well as 11 aerials in that forward air and neutral air, both with a massive amount of range, blow up characters trying to jump and players that are trying to just go in and with their safe aerials. And Daisy spends a lot of time floating and trying to bait and punish. So if you're not on point with your spacing with Daisy, you can find yourself on the back end of a very, very devastating sword as we do see the Falcon come right off the bat. Three, two, one, the Falcon go. looked very good the last time we saw, but, <clears throat> excuse me, but against N, it is a whole different matchup. N, again, undefeated on the season at 10 and 0. We'll have to see here a pivotal third set dictates the pace of the rest of the match. And Ray right now at a bit of an early deficit, but I like the idea they were going for on the edge guard. But N quickly mitigating all that work. 79% on Ray to now 5 after that downbeat from N. N's a Thoron fan. I remember this from both seeing that Thoron there and other sets that they've played. They do love to test your metal a little bit with the fully charged Thoron covering the entire screen and beyond. But at this deficit, not even uh, with a little bit of that healed off from the Nosferatu, we're going to see this extension get as much as possible for Ray. But still surviving up until that up air. Great coverage out from N, uh, knowing that Captain Falcon Mains love to land on you with down air and not letting it happen. Like you said, the coverage so clean. And that up air just beating out the down air of Ray. So N... With that stock lead, continually working away at the second one. Ray is up to 51 right now, but he gets hit by another up air. The neutral B also connects. Ends now lapped him in percent, but he'll be able to make it back to stage. 
border lands. That Levin Sword, so powerful, but here's that ledge trap game. The side bees are on point. The last hitbox will connect, and Ray, a tricky spot. I like the air dodge back to that stage. You can tell N1 on the edge guard got the hit in there, but couldn't follow up with the knee. The up smash won't connect either, and Ray is now at a dangerously high percent. 125 tried to break through, and he'll get punished for it and lose his stock. Ray is down to one, and N still has three. Ooh, and almost finally the up smash after that, and even still 44 damage on a, on a combo that you couldn't even call complete. And is looking marvelous in this first game. This Falcon just getting bullied left and right with um, um, excellent uh, landing punishes. And even if Robin isn't so fast on the ground, they're making up for it with amazing air mobility and well-placed projectiles to cover what Robin na natively can't. Down smash, I like the idea, but it doesn't quite land. Neutral B will. Ooh, that down smash beat out Falcon, and that's gonna be it too. And with a three stock in game number one, seemingly out of thin air. Oof. I mean, poor DI is definitely going to be the blame on that down smash. I mean, no red sparks, no kill screen. You gotta, you're dying for sure. Uh, even, you're dying for sure from bad DI or at very least no DI even if you aren't uh, even, even if you're uh, not seeing any of the flashy effects that Smash Ultimate likes to provide but holy moly what a statement from University of Colorado who's absolutely looking to not only win this game from a record perspective but also seeing a very very clear opportunity since in the previous round we saw the University of Hawaii fall short they're right on that cusp and looking to break through the barrier that teams like university of hawaii do provide and plays like that from n or and showings like that from both n and uh, the erosion are really going to make that happen yeah, and N, again, again, this is why Colorado is so threatening. N has been the thorn in really anyone he's gone against side. Uh, again, undefeated for a reason, for plays like this. So clean, the coverage across the stage. And you mentioned it, how Falcon would tend to struggle in disadvantage here against this character, especially with the way the ledge traps were on point. But that falling up air is what st sticks out in my mind. That was so clean because you could see Falcon's down air, that startup, it was going to come out, it was going to connect, and Falcon's so fast that maybe he gets something off the back of it, but ends up air reaction. As he's about to land, the spacing of that move, so critical and on point. As we get ready for game number two here small battlefield the site i do like this because it forces a bit more kind of boxing interactions which falcon loves to see but we'll have to see if he can get anything off of it because n right now keeping him to the corner good up b it actually ends up connecting the spike doesn't land but the oh my goodness what a conversion there the levin sword nearly helped him out on that edge guard and n almost got a spike off the back of it but ray is able to survive Oh, gets the Nair one as well, looking to pressure on this platform. This game starting off so much better than it did before. The back air whiffing, thanks to good DI in the arc front, in the arc fire. Gotta make the most out of this grab, gets a back air. As Ray is looking to answer at the very least with a wind, if not a multi-stop wind of their own. Choosing just to charge the thunder, being extra, extra careful. But that Levin Nair is such a house. It's, yeah, it's surprisingly huge in a whole lot of ways as it can outrange even things like Shulk Neutral Air. Great patience though from Ray. Great patience, but still the Falcon Kick doesn't land. Trying to find a ledge trap of their own, gets the grab and now edge guard attempt won't make it back, but that back air will seal away the stock. So N dropping their first stock, but quick to respond there. The forward air connects and it's back to dead even here, but Ray able to take that stock and certainly a stronger performance than we saw in game number one to say the least. 
Oh, that's no jump on Ray's part. Do they get... Oh, just choosing to go for the two frame with the down smash. Don't know how much that would have... Or I believe they could have gotten so much more, but hey, they went for the safe thing and are punished for it. As that's a huge combo, but Ray also choosing to not go further and go down with the ship. And N answers in kind, coming off from that strong and at that time finishing their food. What a turnaround. I mean... You land that down air as Ray, and you think, okay, I've got him. And then all of a sudden, you're in a combo, and all you did was give N rage. And I mean, he's only at 47, but still, look at oh, N no. on the ledge here. That sword, that's going to be it. And all of a sudden, the game is gone. N with a two stock victory in game number two. He may have been out of resources, but they aren't out of options. What makes Robin so interesting at least to me personally is the fact that their mana isn't their mana resources a is spread across multiple different tools instead of just being one central mechanic but also when they lose that resource it becomes an item they can play with and these books or, or in that case the actual leaven sword itself are strong like with a lot of base knockback behind them and even doing a ton of shield damage if played correctly and sometimes you don't need to get fancy, you just take the item, throw it straight at a falcon with a used air dodge and no jump, a sitting duck out there. And N cleaning up with a three and then a two stock in such dominant fashion. I mean, it felt like Ray played that game a lot better than game number one, and yet it was still a seven point swing in favor of Colorado. That's how strong that performance was from N. I mean, Ray takes the first stock and then nearly spikes N. And then the game, in a blink of an eye, just ended okay. off of one <laughs> combo. I mean, he gets the spike. N completely turns the situation around off of recovering, you know, gets back to ledge, gets the classic side B ladder combo to uh, into the up smash, and then Ray could get nothing done on the next stock. He gets pushed to the right side of the stage, and he really never made it back. That is such a clean conversion, and it's why N is so threatening. It, the ability we we see occasionally in this league, you know, off of say a pop off stock, something like that. We see, you know, a player usually take a second. They take that deep breath. They say, okay, let's let's reset. Let's bounce back. Let's get back into neutral. N does not need that timer. He just flips a switch. The second he got spiked, he said, okay, here's 11. <laughs> you saw 10. Now here, here's level 11. And he just cranked it up a whole notch. And because of that, Colorado jump out to a massive eight-point lead, 12 to 4 our scoreline with still two sets remaining in this match. Yeah, certainly not impossible, but when you have that player that can be such a backbone to your team, like not getting lost in the sound effects and the gusto of, oh man, Falcon landed his stomp, like I like I could be in serious trouble, just knows that they can recover, has all their resources, get to ledge, and suddenly you're not in combo anymore. You're on ledge, which can, for some characters, be a position of strength. And for Robin, that forward is no joke, and it can lead to so much more. So, like, amazing stuff from N. Love to see them play and loving to see them playing well as they usually end up doing, as you mentioned, undefeated. And they're going to ride this massive lead as far as they can. Two sets to go means it's still very, very close, or can be very, very close as Endure and Beta step up to the plate. And Endure is going to be a tough one for the Weber State team to crack as their two remaining players were... Uh, or either Beta on this Mario or Yo-Yo Guy on his Lucario. And neither one of them particularly love going up against this massive disjoint on the Ike. This is an interesting one, to say the least, because Endor, you know, like we've mentioned, Endor, one of the staple names of this Colorado team. You know, the captain in the fall split, the captain through season two, and then took a, took a little bit of a step back, but after doing so, has played a whole lot cleaner since this name change. And against Mario, like he said, Mario tends to struggle against uh, sword characters just in general. But the one thing I'm remembering now is that, well, uh, 
I was going to say they can get a lot off of Ike being off stage, but maybe not so when Endor just opts to recover high and Beta covers low. <laughs> yeah, it's that was all in. Uh, yes, I'm going to run off and I'm going to forward air, and this is going to be awesome. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're putting yourself really behind the eight ball here, but Ma what Mario natively has against a lot of uh, characters in this game is just the fact that he is quick on their he's quick on his feet, and he can get in and get out and with relative ease. Like the frame data is there, the air speed, the ground speed, it's all there. So if you're able to play a little bit smarter and under a little bit more of a constricted conditions. Mario can handle with the toughies just the same and handle with these sword characters, but Endure now with a lead can play that dashback game that is so threatening. But these uppies have not landed once yet, and it's just going to be on beta to find more and more off of each opening that is provided. 131 on Endure, beta 73, but still very dangerous for both players. Beta. That that uh, dash back up smash or the, the the dash in turnaround up smash. That's one of his kind of staple plays to try and break through neutral. You saw it again right there. Nandor able to outspace it with that nair. That nair just so threatening. And you can tell Endure wants to also try and find a way to end this stock, but he's got to be careful. At 141, Mario's got plenty of strong hits, but. Right now, Endure playing very well defensively. Despite being hit numerous times, it feels like he's only ever getting hit back to stage, back across the stage. And so Mario can't land that finishing blow towards the side of the stage that would end up killing him. As that down air does connect, and it is enough to take that first stock off the board. Yeah, just enough with that last hit, but it's the only one that mattered as Beta. After an SD first stock, you do get a chance to play with Rage a little bit here and play with an Ike at zero. If you're able to find a, a solid grab or a starter like an up air, you can play with this uh, with this low percent uh, Ike with a whole lot of conviction. But Endure playing this very, very well, doing a lot of dashing back and forth, not trying to overcommit and get themselves parried, just looking for a dash attack. Oh, but the get up attack! Blocking a little bit too much of some of Ike's uh, stronger aerials, and the both hits of that getup attack will snap that shield in two. I'm actually shocked that the getup attack did that much shield pressure, but either way, Endor will take it. I mean, that's a crazy interaction. It seemed like Beta had the right idea, but Endor able to capitalize off of it, and because of that, they have built themselves up a substantial lead here. Only 45 in their name, but here comes the classic Mario combos. Lands another up air, wanted the forward air spike, but could not find it. And 25 on Beta right now means that Endure does not have a whole lot of extra credit to their name on this second stock. That up B is going to get punished. There's the grab. Down throw into the up air. Won't find the second one. He will. Oh no, it looked like he might have been able to catch that recovery in, but no dice quite yet. Good air dodge, but that get up is ill advised, and the up smash makes this game tie. A huge setup there from Beta, who is now taking Endure's more patient wrath, throwing out so many of these buttons and really terrible DI on that up air, but lucky he didn't drop the stock right off the bat. Oh, but 86, and now we're finding ourselves in the similar position, but this time Endure is willing to chase, not ready to let Beta control neutral and by sitting back and resting on their laurels. Endure pushed the envelope and was rewarded for it heavily time and time again. That forward air chase was exactly what Endure needed to get out of that game without Beta having any more momentum on their side. Absolutely. And that's one of the, the clutch things about Endure is that we typically see through the middle of those games and really early in game number one, Ike is known for that Nair, the Nair combo, Nair into imagination, really. But we don't see that follow-up or finisher a whole lot of the time from Endure. It's often kind of one and done. The Nair lands, and then maybe they'll air dodge a, out of the forward air, or they'll be only take one up air, and they'll be able to make it back to stage. But Endure has gotten a lot better, especially as the season has gone on, at not just finding one up air, 
or, or you know, nair into up air, but then finding a second one, a third one. Their juggle game has kicked up a notch. And because of that, they were able to take this game from beta here in set no, or in game number one between these two. And a surprisingly close one, given how it started for beta, who quite literally was playing a two stock game in a three stock <laughs> match. But it is uh, it is notable to say that it was for those two stocks, it was close, but it felt like beta was controlling a lot more of the pacing. Beta would find openings and be able to take them for a long ride, but it was really running through indoors, uh, through indoors tempo. And if that control over tempo is very, very important, and you're only trying to play with the lead outside of the game as well as inside of it. We go to Kalos for the next game. A focus on horizontal combos. This can make a decent amount of sense, as well as survivability on the part of Beta, who will be able to get a chance to live some of those up airs and maybe even forward airs that they just barely died from a little bit more often. It's also worth noting here in game number two if Endor wins this game, then it will be a loss on the column for the side of Weber State. They have to find a way to respond here if they want a chance at the victory this week, but Endure looking to try and shut that down. They are at a deficit for the moment. Those up airs won't connect, but the down tilt in the back air will. I like the idea to actually go for that spike, but was not going to be able to land, and that one will. The down throw into the forward air, and bait is on the board. All right, Endure just did nothing at all and let himself get hit by that forward air, which is huge for Beta, because oftentimes when you let Mario players land something like a forward air or finish a ladder combo, their, their confidence skyrockets, and suddenly they're landing things like that up throw into the down air back air. Oh, and up airs out of shield as well. Beta starting to move a little bit, feeling the flow from that fair. Absolutely, 76 to 71, nearly lapped in percent, but that forward air gonna push Beta to the corner here. Parries the up air and he'll be able to make it back to stage. Doesn't get a punish there, but he finds the back air and Endure forced to the side of the stage here. That cape, also very dangerous, but Endure worked his way around there and actually that dash attack snuck underneath and was able to take the stock. So stock's back to even, but the percent still very much so in Beta's favor. Trying to keep him out this corner, but a good air dodge through from Beta. Uh, just little things can start letting Endure get slipped by when it comes to their pressure. Oh, let that roll on, attempting to hunt for the grab. Using the Flood as an attempt to bat away the, the quick draw. I like the idea of it, but Endure not pulling the trigger too early. Good. It's been very well played on both parts, just trying to continuously feel each other out as these up smash percents can mean for a lot more grabs from Endure. Nair into the up air. Beta. Ooh, the drill low. Is it too low? Yes, it is. A beta air dodge that he couldn't get to the ledge. And just like that, it's back to even. And they both agree. Yup, that was absolutely worth it. Last stock between these two in game two. And now Endure gets a chance to go with the uh, go with the motion a little bit. Having that entire stock get traded is only good things for the player at a deficit. As the anti air comes in, looking for a backup, but a little bit too late. Beta needing one of those combos that they found so early in that stock too. As soon as they will just run up and grab. That's how you know Beta Endure is feeling very confident in their positioning right now. Good combos here from Beta. Look at the percent begin to rack yeah. up. Those, those, like you said, those left to right, right to left combos from Beta doing a lot of work here. 99 on Endure right now. And he'll try and find more. The Nair connects and Endure forced to the ledge. Another forward tilt to get him off stage. Up smash won't land yet. Those back airs so well spaced, but the up B thought he'd go to the platform and so he gets hit off to the side instead. Beta's at 68%, charging up that flood, looking for a way to try and ice this game and push us to game number three. The flood connects, but the side B, he ends up not going for the ledge, gets back to center stage, Dash attack in the land. Dangerous spot for Beta. We saw Endure one off forward air last time. One of the down air this time couldn't quite connect it. Playing around center stage once again between these two. Good air there from Beta. 
trying to control stage once more. Running up was Endor. Early up, he gets him back to the ledge. Down air, parry, no follow up. The back air doesn't land either. The flood to keep your, or make sure Endor stays away. But these up airs, so threatening. Forward air, good air dodge around. Doesn't have his wall jump though, and the up beat doesn't get him there. And Endor takes game two and gives Colorado the W. He did have his wall jump though. That's the terrible thing. They could have wall jumped in uh, right up against that wall. The air dodge was the right play. Just needed to wall jump into up B and didn't. And that's so tragic as we endure. Does hold on to a very strong showing from Beta in that game to ping pong back and forth with solid horizontal combos, finding finishers, finding starters. Like it was everything that Mario wants to do in a matchup like that. But endure played it well held on to some key reads and at the end that extra little of aggression they show on last stock that Endor loves to hold on until the end does do them dividends twice over. Yeah, those offstage interactions I think were really the difference maker because you look at that second stock that Beta lost, he lost it relatively early because of that up B thinking he might have had to tech the wall and he probably could have survived if he were able to pull off that wall jump. I think part of the reason you didn't see that wall jump on the last stock is because he pulled the trigger on that up B so early. I think he wanted to use that move, the wall jump a little bit earlier to instantly snap back to the ledge to see if he could punish uh, Endor's recovery, but he just didn't have the time to do so and ends up falling prey to that. So with that victory, Colorado lock in the W, but we still will play out this fifth and final set uh, between these two. Those players are being locked in now, as you're seeing on your screen. It's Yo-Yo Guy, the classic Lucario, making its appearance here. And this is Carlish for the side of Colorado. Carlish, we haven't seen a ton of uh, this semester, but Carlish has been very good. In fact, Carlish got a victory in that upset win against DePaul. He's 2-1 and one on this Terry, and this is a... I feel like this is a very double-edged sword type of matchup. Similar to, I think, the last set we saw Yo-Yo Guy in, Terry kind of gets his two or three neutral interactions and then wins another to get your stock. But also, Lucario gets that bonus from taking a lot of percent and being at a deficit. So both players have that sort of comeback factor in their character kit. Curious to see how they play it out against each other here. Yeah, not sure what the uh, initial confusion was. Uh, was uh, oh, they were just doing a button check. Never mind. Either way, it is a we're getting a preview of the matchup that we're going to be playing against. Not only is it Carlos against Yo-Yo Guy, who both have done uh, different, uh, both have played differing amounts, but the results from both players are very much there. Yo-Yo Guy, I believe, only one or two losses on the season has been rather consistent with this Lucario. In matchups that aren't exactly ideal, you're going into the, uh, the unfortunate uh, thing of Yukario into an FGC character. While you can move well with Terry uh, and move well so around Terry, Terry just is able to blow you up. And that's never a good thing for Lucario, who's consistently at a deficit when it comes to hit kill, uh, when it comes to kill power and aura reliance. Almost finding an edge guard, but good recovery from Carlos. The yo yo guy just committing a little too early to that dash back forward smash. That's something to watch as this goes on. That's a tricky sort of edge guard from yo yo guy. That spacing has to be really on point if he's going to be able to pull off that down air because Carlos won't be able to snap to ledge as cleanly. But it is Carlos with the big lead here 76 to carlish's name doesn't find the up smash surprisingly yo-yo guy gets out of that one he's at 143 this is a lot of damage this could be very dangerous if carlos doesn't take the stock soon yo these two are smash attacking at each other like there is plans to throw their bodies and just like they're hitting those c sticks if they play smash sticks otherwise oh that could have been huge but the force bomb flame still comes in clutch this is a ton of aura but from cross stage is not going to do it and Terry has their special sauce going on but it doesn't even need it as the rising tackle hits just through stage Yo-Yo Guy wanting to set up for a down air but it was just a little bit too late this is huge 
because of that, they lose their stock. And now this is when things get really dangerous as Carlish gets the spike and Yo-Yo Guy in the blink of an eye is on his last stock. I believe we're going to be seeing the switch out from Yo-Yo Guy. I know we know he has an Ike in the back of his own. Uh, maybe they want to just play out the matchup, but as you get the forward air into back air, Lucario can just be overwhelmed so quickly coming up against many of the FGC characters. Terry arguably the one he does the best against, and we're seeing how it, how it can sometimes go. I have to see, you know, your guy's still fighting though, 70, or sorry, 67, make that 89 off of that forward smash to Carlish's name, we'll be able to find that edge guard here. Yo-Yo Guy at 42%, but every bit of percent is going to build up his aura, and Carlish is really one hit away from having Go online, and that's where things get very scary for both of them. Shield pressure, a lot of it, but Yo-Yo Guy will be able to make it back to stage. You can't find the forward smash, and the power dump won't connect either, but there's the combo. Yo-Yo Guy now at 105. Neutral B connects, but Carlish will survive. Go online. Does he pull the trigger on something? Yes, he does, but the neutral B, that will take the stock, and it's down to the last stocks here. Dangerous, uh, dangerous occurrences potentially ahead. 130 aura is nothing to sneeze at. Oh, gets the aura sphere potentially into down air, but Carlish with some great DI to get out of it, keeping themselves on the ground and ready to intercept with that uppercut. Carlish. Okay. Taking game one and what could potentially have gotten extremely close. Carlos with a big game there to take that one via a one stock, but also worth noting, I think one of the, the, the reason that that catch happens on the up smash, we saw this numerous times. This is kind of a staple of Yo-Yo Guy, that uh, reversal on the neutral beat. You use that aura sphere to try and approach and Carlish called it out with that up smash. So. I, like you said, I wouldn't be surprised to see a character change, but I also wouldn't be shocked to see Yo-Yo Guy just try and ride this one out if he can. Because you saw, towards the end of that game, he started to get a lot of work done, especially at those higher percents. The question is, playing around those high percents can be very difficult. You, know, you make a mistake and you might lose your stock for it, but if you don't, you are very likely to take a stock with both of these characters. I'm curious to see what's going through the mind of uh, Yo-Yo Guy right about now. Yeah, it's a tense decision, but inevitably it is a decision that doesn't really affect the end of the game. You can always use this as like hardcore matchup practice if you're looking to keep leading Lucario in a lot of these matchups, or if you're looking to practice your secondary, that Ike is very, very much there. And we can see where Lucario does find a lot of success in a matchup like this. Terry does rely on a little bit more of, uh, does actually, actually have a lot more neutral in him than a couple other of the common FGC reps. Ken is killing you off a hit. Uh, Kazuya is killing you off of less than a hit in a lot of times. <laughs> but the, <laughs> But Terry, he's doing 40, but he's doing 40 to 50 or more. But he's using that to set up into ledge play or to set up into uh, high damage scenarios where things like down tilt into something like a burn knuckle will kill or he's getting to the point where he has the percent lead leading into his go moves which then creates some added shenanigans it's it's a lot more it gives lucario a lot more means of survivability as they do choose to roll it out on town and city Town and City, the site of game number two between these two. Again, Colorado has secured the victory for this week, but Weaver State trying to cut into that lead, trying to mitigate the amount of damage that's been dealt to them. They've had a, a, a rough past two weeks between their loss uh, to Sacramento State that we saw just a week ago, and now here against Colorado, two teams that are in the thick of things when it comes to that playoff race. A loss to Weber State really opens up the door for a lot of those teams on the outside, and Colorado now starting to make a push for that middle of the pack, trying to secure their spot in that national bracket. But right now, Yo-Yo Guy with a focus on winning this set as he's built himself up a pretty substantial lead that Carlish quickly cuts into. Yeah, this is a really strong position for Lucario where you can use that aura to snowball a little bit, but this the 
auto turnaround is such a hassle for Lucario and any character that loves to cross up. As you mentioned, that the B reverse Aura Sphere is a common, common thing that Lucario players love to do. As a great parry on that neutral air does get Carla to stock off of an up smash. Not a true punish, but definitely the right one in that scenario. And now, Yo Yo Guy hasn't been touched on this stock so far, still continuing to work away. That Carlish is stock, and I feel like these grabs doing so much work for the Yo-Yo guy. But here's a quick conversion. Make that 36 on the Yo-Yo guy stock. The Nair trades, and it's Yo-Yo guy in control at the moment. Go now comes online. This is where things can get a little terrifying for Yo-Yo guy. Dash attack lands. Power geyser will not. Well, up B, I think that was supposed to be a, a reversal, but either way, the back air connects, and that's actually going to be the stock. It's Carlish who will be put to last stock first here in game number two. Yeah, I mean, miss input aside, you played it right. You're forcing Carlish to commit to either Power Geyser or Bust. Carlish's air mobility on those tri platform on that tri plat layout extremely effective but Carlish still not trying to let yo-yo guy off this ledge for free oh that air dodge will do it though as yo-yo guy answers with a two stock whether earned or not there it is as we head into the final game of the set put a, little, a few more points on the board for yo-yo guys uh, personal stats even if that's not going to make up the difference two more points headed to Yo-Yo Guy and Weber State, but we will have to see wh what that all leads to as we get ready for game number three upcoming. It is an 11 point game, but these two teams have really gone back and forth. And these two players in particular, I almost feel like the difference maker was, was the stage because you could tell Yo-Yo Guy was getting so much off of grabs. You know, the, the number of times Carlos just could not find a way to land and yo-yo guy was there to punish accordingly i think was a a massively influential portion of this game that allowed yo-yo guy to grab the lead and hold on to it so i feel like we're gonna we're gonna see a very different stage here for game number three it's small battlefield actually the site of it for our very last match here between colorado and weaver state have to see here as now we get these two back and forth down B connects and uh, now we'll have to see if yo-yo guy can get anything done here 71% make the 89 to his name is down B lands make it twice yo-yo guy able to make it back to the stage but get up attack gets him off the ledge Carlish in decent control of this first stock and also doing a good job of tracking down the movement. First time we've really seen the down air of Yo-Yo Guy land there, and because of that, Carlos forced the ledge, but only for a moment, he'll find the up smash. Stock number one is off the board here, as it is still Carlos trying to find a way to seal away the second Yo-Yo Guy. He'll be pushed to the corner, the down beat doesn't connect. Neutral B, not gonna find its marker at the ledge. Carlish's movement on point right now, despite getting hit by that air dodge. And, well, I guess timing is everything. Of course, the, the, I'll take the blame for that one, Carlish. The moment I call out his movement being on point, he ends up SDing. So that's, that's the commentator's curtain. And he'll quickly make back up for it with that up smash to make it a two to one scoreline here. But Yo-Yo Guy, Still has that one stock to play with. Gets forward thrown, has to find a way back. We did see Carlos land a spike in game number one. The down B continuing to whittle away at this last stock. Yo-Yo got forward smash, doesn't land. Combo still coming through here for Carlish, but oh, able to get too much are, off of it. We are back, ladies and gentlemen, and what have I come <laughs> back to? Uh, the small battlefield pick really not working out for Yo-Yo guys. The, a lot of close scrambles with some of these hitbox exchanges, which is super hard for Terry. And 
the getup attack is hard punish. Yo Yo Guy been throwing out plenty of forward smashes of their own, but not finding that one in the end. Uh, uh, getting forward smash of his own at the end of the day. Yeah, and uh, with that, Colorado, they get the victory there in set number five. They go up to a scoreline here of 22-8, as you're seeing, and Colorado, a solid victory. I feel like the difference maker in that one, honestly, Carlos just kind of found another gear, uh, I think. Just, the, yeah, <laughs> welcome back to the We're welcome back to the studio. Uh, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Yeah, we're excited to have you back. Because uh, Now, I know you didn't get to see much of that game in particular, but I feel like it was a lot of kind of yo-yo guy fishing for something to, you know, yo-yo guy had some combos, but a lot of it was just kind of a stray hit, a down air got landed or a, uh, a nair. And there was really no combo game like we saw in game number two there. It was really Carlish just doing Terry things, landing combos time and time again. It, it felt like because of, because the Terry was able to land such cleaner conversions, Yo-Yo guy really couldn't get anything started. Yeah, I mean, sometimes that's the, the way things go. <laughs> If you're in any sort of matchup, especially against Terry, who has just amazing boxing frame data, that if you try to get things started and then Terry jabs you, and it's like, well, dang, guess I take 35. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's it's frustrating. It can be really, really frustrating to go against Terry, who just has such a who is such a more well-rounded character compared to some of the other FGC representatives who focus on, if you're in Ryu, it's a lot of fireball camping. If you're Ken, it's just run you down, try and down tilt and see what works. And if you're Kazuya, it's that invulnerability with the command dash that you always have to worry about and this long combo chains on top of it all. But Terry feels just much more centered and plays like it while still having what, everything that makes an FGC rep good. Yeah. Uh, the Terrys in the EGF have been very successful. You look at just across the board players like Moat from Iona and so on and so forth. Even DePaul have one in Stigma, I believe, is the that tag who's had a, uh, a a very successful run. Weber State, they fall to three and four. They get Sacramento State, who we actually got their matchup last week against them. So an interesting run back to say the least as their playoff life will be on the line. But we will be jumping to a short break to get an interview with one of the Colorado players after this. Don't touch that dial now. We're just getting started.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the EGFC. We are here with Endure after their victory over Weber State this week. Endure, how do you feel about Colorado's performance this week? I'm feeling pretty good. That was a good showing from the team, uh, as, as we have been doing the past few weeks. I'm really proud of our play. Yeah, as we get closer and closer, you guys are to the end of the season and to the playoff race. You guys are right on the cusp of both making it and falling short. Uh, true. With your final opponent uh, coming up next week and your play on the rise, how well do you feel like you guys won't be uh, will be able to not only make the playoffs but also make a splash in them? I feel confident both about uh, about both of those situations. Um, Honestly, this has been a weird season for us. We've been struggling finding players, so two of our losses were to forfeits, unfortunately. But now that we've figured everything out, gotten our lineup correct, uh, I mean, we beat DePaul recently. We've been on a winning streak since then. Uh, I, I have very high hopes for, for our season uh, going forward. Yeah, I mean, it's been really a, a complete reversal for you guys. I mean, last last split, it was very much so a, a kind of roller coaster, just back and forth kind of win loss win loss and this season as you mentioned your only real losses are those forfeits to wichita state and sacramento otherwise you guys have been playing with kind of a, a newfound fire what's been the difference maker for you guys uh well two things one i found some new players which is very helpful uh loosened up the requirements that we could make sure we didn't forfeit but secondly i've just started you know really getting on the players to put their all into these games make sure they're showing up 100 percent serious but, and I think everybody's been getting a lot more into it, you know? Uh, they've been practicing more. They've been really trying to show their best out there. Uh, and I'm proud of the players. Uh, change. Going, yeah, from split one to split two. Right. And with that uh, leading into it, as you as you play, as your players are getting more and more invested into this league and, you know, winning cures everything, how is that, uh, how has your practice uh, regimen uh, increased or changed from uh, in, in, as we lead into this, as we go into the final uh, regimen of this split? Yeah, uh, well, one thing that has helped is I was able to get Slatty, a player that y'all have seen play before, to help me run a second practice. Uh, because earlier I just didn't have the time. Um, and that, that's opened up a lot more opportunities for players to get that practice against other player, players on the team. You know, if they couldn't make the first practice, now they can make the second practice. Some players are able to make both. And then in addition to that, I've just started requiring all the players to attend the games, whether I'm sending them or not. Um, and, and I feel like that's built a, a lot of camaraderie across the team. So, uh, yeah, he's just getting closer and better and it's all good. Yeah, you guys wrap up your regular season next week against South Alabama, and you guys are really right in the in the thick of things in uh, the playoff scenario. So, how do you, uh, I guess, prepare for next week, knowing that you know, really, your your seating could very much so change based on well how you do and how some of your, uh, well, uh, competitors do as well. This is very true. Uh, I think step one, we're not going to worry about the other competitors, right? Take take care of what we can take care of. Just do the best we can. Uh, that being said, I've been looking at South Alabama. Um, they're a good team. It's going to be a good fight, but I, I fully believe that we can put that one away and make sure we get another win. Uh, and from there, what happens, happens. Sounds like a plan, and I hope to see you next week put on a similar show as you did this week in such a strong showing up against such a strong team in and of their and in of South Alabama. Uh, do you have any final shout outs or uh, comments uh, going into it? Yeah, I'll just shout out Mediocre. That's a, a new player that we showcased this week. He went up against one of Weber State's best, and even though he didn't take the win, I think he did an excellent job. So, shout outs to him. Yeah, the the depth of the roster really stepping up as you as you mentioned. So uh, once again, congratulations on your victory this week and thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next week when you guys take on South Alabama. Hey, thank you so much. I'll see you then. <laughs> thank you. And with thank that, you. we will be going to another short break here to get ready for our final match of the night, a rematch of the MAC semifinals. It's the Quinnipiac Bobcats and the Manhattan Jaspers. After this, don't go anywhere. 